Welcome back into the GSMC Sports Podcast. We're now going to be talking about the Dallas Mavericks who took Game 3 against the Oklahoma City Thunder, build up their first series lead against this team, and I was definitely very worried about the Mavericks coming out of Game 1. The injury with Luka continues to still be a concern, and he is dealing with a real injury, and we see him, it seems like two to three times a game, have some sort of other run-in where it looks like he's not going to get up, but he does continue to do so, and the Mavericks are still rolling, and in large part, as much as Luka absolutely deserves credit for continuing to be the hub of the entire team here... I do think that it is Kyrie Irving that has been the main catalyst for the Mavericks sort of staying alive in this series. Now, I've been giving out tons of Kyrie praise during this series, so I don't want to, you know, stay on it necessarily all too long, but it is this sort of controlled aggression with him where we know at any given point he is going to be able to score. It feels like anytime he plays a first half where he was being a little bit more passive. He is just this, you know, waiting volcano to explode and end up, you know, going on this scoring frenzy. But the continued attention to detail for him of this is the best version of Kyrie I think we've ever seen. And it's because of the teammate that he is where, again, in terms of pure skill, we have seen Kyrie breaking people's ankles and hitting these crazy shots for his entire career. But the advanced maturity with him is just so encouraging to see. And again, I know that a lot of people do sort of tend to go to revisionist history and talk about the fact that Kyrie's always been this. He really hasn't been though. And there has been a little bit of a question about his buy-in at times, but You can see it with the playmaking. You can see it with the defense where he is just working so hard at it game in, game out. And I think that it has possibly even inspired Luka to be better himself on the defensive end. Now, at times still, we know Luka's dealing with this defense. It seems like his lateral movement isn't quite up to speed as, as much as you would prefer at least. But I think that Kyrie has been massive for the Mavericks in terms of getting the other players involved as well. We saw another good PJ Washington game dropping 27 points. I believe that's the same number he had in game two as well that we covered last week already, but PJ Washington continuing to be effective for them. And, you know, in this game, as much as it's Kyrie setting up other people, you then have the end of the game where it seemed like they were pretty much toast there, or at least the offensive possession, you could say. There wasn't a chance where it was um, Jalen Williams, the the J-Dub, of course, smothering Kyrie throughout the possession, about 18 seconds, and he ends up getting that running layup to go and end up sending uh, sending the Thunder home with a loss in this situation, so... You know, this has continued to be very impressive for the Mavericks, who I have, I feel like, varied on a decent amount when they made the moves at the trade deadline. A lot of people were scrutinizing them. I thought that baseline, they were going to be a lot of fun to watch, and that they have been, and it's because of these these mid-season additions in P.J. Washington and Daniel Gafford, but it's just, it seems like the chemistry of this team has just you know, come full circle here where, you know, there were the stories of how the locker room didn't necessarily click with Grant Williams. And now you have somebody in PJ Washington who seems like he can kind of make some moves off of the dribble himself. And I feel like for Washington, what he kind of reminds me of, not from a play style perspective necessarily, but in terms of the situation that he sort of came into the NBA with, is it reminds me slightly of Aaron Gordon when he came into the league. He was drafted by the Orlando Magic, and at that point, the Magic just really had nothing going for them as an organization in terms of postseason hopes. And Gordon, he was this player that showed flashes. He, of course, was in 
the dunk contest. So people knew the name and knew that he had some promise, but there was just a level that he clearly wasn't going to reach in terms of being the alpha on a contending team. And PJ Washington, it feels like a little bit, was in that same boat where he was a late lottery pick when he was drafted, went to a high profile school school in Kentucky, and Charlotte was just a little bit messy. And it seemed like there were opportunities for him to fully take over, but instead he was just a solid player that maybe let down in terms of people setting high expectations for him. And now he is in a competitive environment where he can be his talents are being put to use in terms of being a role player, if you want to call it that. And he is executing at an extremely high rate. The three-point shot for him has been a massive development. And I've said this all year. I don't think that there is anybody who gets the ball with two seconds on the shot clock more than P.J. Washington. But he just continues to fire. There's no hesitation with him where we've seen a little bit of hesitation with some of their other players that I do think can be a little bit concerning. Derek Jones Jr. for as impactful as he is on the defensive end. It seems like sometimes he gets a little bit gun shy. You could say a similar thing for Josh Green as well. And I love the minutes that they provide because of the energy. But P.J. Washington just does not let himself get down in these instances. He understands the role. You play great defense. When you have to, you can take things off of the dribble. He's been big for them rebounding as well. I think he had 11 in game two, something along those lines. And then uh, in this instance, you know, you stand in the corner, you wait for Kyrie and Luka to pass you the ball, you fire away. That's just, it is the understanding. I just mentioned Grant Williams earlier. He talked about how difficult it is to be one of those other players in that system and just sort of sit around waiting for your shot. But it seems like PJ Washington has just embraced it and we're seeing an awesome version of him and it is really encouraging to see. Now, um, I guess last thing I'll say before I move on to the Thunder in this instance, um, the center minutes have been pretty interesting where we saw the the whole hack a lively situation late in the fourth quarter of this game. Chet Holmgren is trying to chase Lively down. It's just these two seven footers basically playing tag, it looks like, where Lively is running out of bounds and running all around the court. And it was just a very funny um, sort of visual to see. But, you know, I do think that Lively has sort of almost earned the respect of the Thunder in some way that they are trying to scare him out of the game essentially by giving him these intentional fouls putting him on the spot and you know he did pretty well for himself by the end of that where I think he missed three of his first four in these hack of lively situations but he ended up finishing the game eight of 12 from that free throw line and his continued development I mean I don't know if I was necessarily fully familiar with his game in Duke at, when he was playing at Duke like this. He was absolutely hurt by the fact that there wasn't the level of spacing that obviously we now see in the NBA and the way that he can sort of play into this system just a lot smoother and it's making for some great performances from him. So you have to appreciate that. But on the Thunder side of this, you know, the, the youth is definitely catching up to them to some degree. We are continuing to see these Josh Giddy minutes dip and dip as the games go on. Played just 13 minutes in this game. Going to be really interesting to see what they do with him in the offseason because with all of the assets that they have in terms of draft capital and even with some young players as well, feels like you have to upgrade that final spot and, you know, for the Thunder, like, he could potentially, I guess, be, you know, more of a... Because we saw, we saw him earlier in the year when some of the other starters were missing. He was able to find his game a little bit more. I don't think that he is necessarily just fully washed out now. But in this Thunder system, especially when it comes to these playoff minutes, I mean, Shea Gilgis-Alexander just played 42 minutes on Saturday when these teams faced off. That is... There's no need for a backup point guard to the, if you want to call it pedigree, I mean, former number six overall pick and somebody who showed tons of promise in his rookie season. So 
I feel like they they just need to find a better option for him in that starting lineup. They have run a couple different options here. We've seen Cason Wallace play some of these big time fourth quarter minutes in place of him. It was Aaron Wiggins, I believe, in game two that got the call. Isaiah Joe, it seems like some of the minutes that he gives are their most impactful. So they're trying a bunch of different things here in terms of figuring out who to actually play at that giddy position. But I would expect this is going to be his last season with the Thunder. But let me know in the comment section if there is a specific team. I mean, I'm just sort of saying this as I'm thinking it out. I feel like wouldn't necessarily be a horrible fit in terms of being a playmaker, not having to take on much of a scoring role, but setting others up. If you were to go to San Antonio, Devin Vassell, his ability to play sort of off of the ball and being a great catch and shooter hasn't been utilized because of the fact that there hasn't been a traditional point guard. Wemby, of course, they need to actually get him a playmaker. Now again, going to talk more about the draft lottery tomorrow, but they get the fourth and eighth overall picks in this upcoming draft, so maybe they can find an option there, but Giddy might be somebody rolling the dice on too as well, but as for the rest of the Thunder here, you know, Jalen Williams, J-Dub, is definitely dealing with some type of injury, but his game hasn't necessarily translated to the postseason quite in the way that we wanted to. Now, he was a most improved player, at least candidate, and he... He, sh you know, he showed that he can definitely be a top 25 player in the league, but he is struggling a little bit as things currently stand. It's not even like he had a bad game necessarily, but in terms of you know, the fact that he was scoring 20 plus points a game and being this go-to guy for them, just doesn't seem like he's at that same level. Now again, he was dealing with some sort of foot ankle injury, kept him out for the majority of the third quarter and some of the fourth as well. So injuries, obviously everybody's dealing with something at this point. Nobody is fully healthy that's actually getting playing time in the postseason. I think that, you know, I'm going to stick with my pick of the Thunder because of the fact that I, I'm just not really trying to waver like that, but the Mavericks are in a very good position. They're going to be facing off against the Thunder tonight at 9.30 Eastern with a chance to really take a commanding lead here. I think the Thunder have a good chance to bounce back, but let me know what you think in the comments section. For now, though, we are going to be taking our third break of the show, and when we come back on the other side, want to dive into the Boston Celtics, the conversation surrounding Jason Tatum after finally putting together a more, you know, scoring first game. Has he answered the questions about the doubts surrounding the Celtics team? We're going to be answering that, but first, a quick break, so stick with us. We will be right back. <laughs> 